Well, so at this time, I want to welcome Sue. Uh, thank you for being with us, Sue. It's a great honor to have you here. Sue is the CEO of the Digital Technology Supercluster. She's been recognized for her community and business leadership with awards including Honorary Doctorate of Technology at BCIT, the UBC Faculty of Law Distinguished Alumni Award, the University of Victoria Distinguished Entrepreneur, YMCA Women of Distinction, the Queen's Council, Hall of Fame for Canada's Top 100 Most Powerful Woman, and the Influential Woman in Business Lifetime Achievement Award. A lot of achievements, Sue. It's really our pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Drew, and, and thanks everyone. It's, it's an honor to provide some comments on a topic that's likely near and dear to all of us, and arguably more important than it ever has been before. Thank you to the program sponsors, as Drew mentioned, for making this event possible, and to the awe-inspiring list of speakers that the organizers have put together. I'm kind of lucky that I'm going first, because I know it's just going to get better all throughout the, the conference. Digital transformation of our businesses, our public services, and our social and private lives was growing before t February 2020. One year into the global pandemic, it's become a critical element of success for every organization, every public service, every institution, and likely for our families and our community organizations as well. No organization is too big or too small to escape the wave of digitization. Our world is now digital. Digital technologies bring tremendous benefits to organizations of every size and in every sector. The seeming ubiquitous access to data and information presents opportunities, it presents challenges and pitfalls, and it presents risks, as Drew and I were just talking about. Risks to our businesses, to our public services, to governments, to economies, and to individual citizens. Every day, my team and I at the Digital Supercluster work with organizations of all sizes, from multinationals to startups, from large government agencies to entrepreneurial ventures. The kind of small and medium organizations that make up so much of our economy. We see the impact and the potential of SMEs on our community as Canada's future prosperity grows and will continue to grow once we work through the pandemic. We remember, as, BC, as RBC noted pre-pandemic, small businesses are key to the Canadian economy, representing 42% of GDP and 48% of new jobs. We also see the obstacles that Canadian industry is forced to navigate in protecting privacy. Protecting privacy is a real and significant issue for organizations today, but it doesn't need to be. Small organizations right now often don't have the resources to understand Canada's mesmerizing quagmire of privacy rules and legislation. And larger organizations sometimes have full departments devoted just to this issue. The current mix of privacy-related legislation in Canada is complex, it's confounding, sometimes it's unhelpful for organizations who do business in Canada, and it can be a real deterrent for organizations who want to invest in here and do business in our country. Through a trading lens, Canada is a small nation. As a small trading nation, we used to measure our success based on our ability to move goods and sometimes services. Canada and the provinces invested in infrastructure to connect our country by road, by rail, by highway, and beyond that to international markets through our airports and our ports. The infrastructure that was developed then and the governance around it was essential to establish Canada's presence and leadership in the global market for the trade of goods and services. Today's world is rooted in data. The creation, protection, leveraging, commercialization, sharing, and growing of data is fundamental to economies and to business success. It's fundamental to Canada's success. It powers the world. Yes, hard goods on ships and rails and in airports and ports are still critical. Today, the legislative infrastructure and the governance that effectively protects and leverages the data that's used to monitor these goods, how they're shipped, where they're going, how fast, is essential, and it's essential that we know how that information and data is shared, protected, and governed. Forbes noted that more data has been created in the last two years than in the previous history of humanity, and that trend is growing. Within five years, there will be 70 billion smart devices around the world collecting data 24-7. 
This creates opportunities and challenges for Canadian companies and Canadian citizens. We must remain competitive on our approach to the collection, protection, curation, privacy, sharing and commercialization of data. If we don't do this, it's as if we stopped building the railway system in Saskatchewan or the Trans-Canada Highway in Manitoba or we failed to expand our ports and our airports. More than ever, we need a modernized, flexible, resilient, clear and practical approach to privacy and to the handling of data. One that protects the rights of individuals, the interests of individuals and works well with organizations and govern governments while making sure that the data runs on the digital highways and that those digital highways and data highways are open for Canadian business and open for those who want to invest here. Unfortunately, our current pan-Canadian approach to legislation is a bit more akin to a swamp than to a superhighway. With some provinces adopting the federal framework of privacy while others have created a bespoke approach. The result is detrimental to Canada, to Canadian business, to our potential to restart and grow our economy and to our future success. We must and we can do better. The world is not going to wait for us to get this right. We all know that today businesses do not operate just in BC or in Nova Scotia or even just in Canada. Citizens and businesses expect and deserve the same protections and rights relative to data and privacy, whether they are in Prince Rupert or Brandon or Quebec City. And that's not the case right now. A business operating in Canada needs right now to comply with at least four privacy statutes, all with different regulatory regimes, different privacy commissioners and systems. And navigating four regimes might be frustrating, but that's not even the full picture. There are also several other pieces of legislation that add to the complexity. Some apply to the private sector, some apply to the public sector. There are special legislative provisions for health and for other industries. There are situations where sometimes it's not even clear which legislation applies to a certain set of data or a certain company. Few, if any, of these laws have been comprehensively updated recently. But, encouragingly, there are several initiatives now underway, which present a huge opportunity, and I will say imperative, to Canadian policymakers, legislators, and to all of us. We must work together. The good news is that the initiatives that are underway create the perfect opportunity for us to do this. Quebec is undertaking a major overhaul of its Privacy Act. A few months ago, the federal government introduced Bill C-11, which I'll talk about shortly, and Ontario and BC were also in the midst of reviewing their policy legislation in the summer. Now, more than ever before, we must work together as a country to avoid multiple jurisdictions going in different directions. Our collective goal should be to produce pragmatic, flexible, and clear legislations. Our companies and our citizens, large and small, live, invest, and work in a global market. If Canada continues with the legislative quagmire, it's going to impact our trade, it's going to impact innovation. We have an opportunity to streamline, to modernize, and to strengthen our privacy approach across the entire country. The Government of Canada took an important step in introducing Bill C-11 just before Christmas. As many of you know, in mid-November, the government introduced that new bill to enact the Consumer Privacy Protection Act, or CPPA for short, and the Personal Information Tribunal Act. This combination is the modernizing of the Personal Information Protection Electronic Documents Act, or PIPIDA for short. And I will say the acronyms are one area where we could start to streamline and make things a little clearer. That legislation, the PIPIDA, is nearly two decades old, which feels like a century in the digital age. I'm just going to note that other countries, such as Japan, have now legislatively required that amendments to privacy legislation must be considered every three years, with the goal of making sure that privacy legislation is adapted to the rapid evolution of technology and global standards for protecting data and information. BC, Bill C-11 is ambitious, it's also cautious. It aims to do four things. First, operationalize the federal government's digital charter. Second, bring to life past proposals to strengthen privacy protection. Third, address challenges proposed by the digital economy and new technologies. 
and fourth, to enact the Personal Information Data Protection Tribunal Act, establishing a new Personal Information and Data Protection Tribunal, which, have, which would have the ability to impose major penalties. The CPPA proposes some serious steps to protect privacy. For example, fines for breaches have been described by some as the strongest among the G7 uh, economy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, including uh, stronger than in the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, and the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. How strong are these penalties? Well, what's proposed is $10 million or up to 3% of an organization's gross global revenues. While clearly inspired by similar, similar initiatives in countries and regions, namely the EU and California, the Canadian proposal is unique in its approach. In many instances, it affords businesses greater flexibility and clarity than present legislative schemes do. Notably, it borrows directly from past guidance and decisions issued by privacy commissioners and provides individuals with new rights that are more narrowly framed than those currently found in the GDPR. However, at the same time, right now, Quebec's Bill C-64 seeks to amend its provincial privacy regime in a way that is considerably more onerous than the CPPA. This raises a number of challenges from an interoperability standard across our country and for businesses and citizens who live in Canada. As I mentioned, Ontario and BC are also conducting reviews of their privacy legislation. British, Columbia, British Columbia's privacy commissioner, who I think is going to speak later uh, in the conference, recommended that BC's Personal Information Protection Act be reformed to align closely with the provincial and federal and international standards. That's a ray of light. While all these proposals are likely to undergo a number of revisions before becoming law, forums such as this conference is the perfect venue to discuss the importance of enhancing consistency amongst Canada's privacy laws. We must respect the fundamental elements of our charter, and we must also respect the reality of today's world. We can no longer operate in silos across this country when it comes to data protection and privacy. The same goes for industry. Organizations of all types and all sizes must make privacy a top priority. Last year, TELUS CEO Darren Entwistle and privacy expert Anne Kavokian wrote a very interesting thought leadership piece in the Globe and Mail. They rightly noted that as news of data breaches and questionable information handling uh, was appearing constantly and too frequently in the news, and we were just talking about it. We were just talking about one of the recent ones just, uh, just yesterday's. Uh, consumers become more skeptical, skeptical about working with businesses when we hear and see breaches about how our information and how our data is being handled. And we wonder whether uh, organizations, public and private, are taking appropriate steps to protect our privacy. Consequently, those organizations that prioritize the privacy of their customers gain a corresponding consumer advantage. By proactively protecting the integrity of customer data and supporting consumer privacy, companies both realize meaningful economic benefits and they'll build greater consumer trust and trust across the community. Perhaps the most effective way to earn a reputation as a trustworthy steward for customer data is to embed foundation principles such as privacy by design into every element of our businesses. Privacy by design states that relying on a framework that simply enforces privacy protection after a data breach or a privacy uh, infraction is too little, too late. Privacy by design establishes a proactive model of prevention, tasking businesses with enshrining protective privacy measures as a default for their organizational protocols by building them into all of their policies, procedures, design processes, and products. In other words, a top-to-bottom, cradle-to-grave approach to the life cycle management of information. For my team's part at the Digital Supercluster, we're supporting digital in initiatives to advance effective protection and leveraging of data. I could spend all morning talking to you and regaling you with issues around our projects and the success that we're having, especially when it comes to information protection. But let me speak about just one as I wrap up. Imagine being able to present a complete medical history to your healthcare professional. 
from test results to prescription history and treatment records. Currently, Canada's vital health data remains mostly unconnected, preventing healthcare professionals and sometimes even patients from seeing all or even part of your medical history. Integrating this data brings technical challenges as well as raises privacy concerns about who has access to this information and how they get access to it. Starting with the premise that we own our own health data, giving people secure control of their healthcare data is the goal of a project that we call the Personal Health Wallet. My project team, led by Molecular U, Stone Paper, and UBC, and including representatives and advisors from the government of British Columbia, Roche Canada, IBM, Microsoft, and a host of other well-known organizations. They are putting together a project based on open source blockchain technology. This will give individuals complete control of and access to their health data and the cryptography to support the security, authenticity, and integrity of that data. Through this technology, users will be able to choose to share their information with researchers, doctors, other health care professionals, and do it in a way that lets them retain control of their personal health information. Knowing that in doing so, their privacy and security of all that data is protected. The long-term goal is a personal health wallet for every interested Canadian to confidently upload and share their health information with approved parties. This digital wallet is being developed collaboratively with different organizations bringing different ideas, experiences, expertise, and perspectives, and working together, coming up with a solution better than any single organization could come up with on its own. This kind of approach is the approach we need to take in evolving our matrix of privacy legislations across the country. We can and we must collaborate across the province. Thank you, Sue, for those great insights into the challenges that businesses face in Canada's patchwork. I can only imagine what it's like in the U.S., of course, with 52 states and the amount of legislation they have there. But I understand the challenges that businesses have. And we as privacy commissioners, uh, I was privacy commissioner in B.C. for two years, and it's a challenge to investigate international organizations when you've got jurisdictional issues that are different across the provinces. Privacy commissioners collaborate often because they have to, but they at sometimes are constrained by their own legislation. Mm -hmm. And of course, they make recommendations every year to have that updated. Uh, I'm with you in terms of let's get this patchwork modernized and make it easy for business to do business and do it appropriately when we're dealing with personal information. Thank you so much for that. Thanks very much.